Right, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And you guys are very, very lucky because you get a second person who's in love with genetics in Rome this afternoon. So you should try it sometime just to quote her. So, um, so um, this has been an incredibly enjoyable day for me. And forgive me if I say perhaps surprisingly so. I have given a so-called career talk a number of times before, and I'm always the only person who does it, or one of very few people, and it's a sort of token effort in an apartment or at some conference. And so um, often my career is considered to be an alternative career, which is why I have this, this title. Um, and as I will um, show you in a minute, as, I, as I'm sure you of course know, and I know Monica started uh, today's meeting uh, with a similar uh, statistic is that it's very much not an alternate career. Actually being a, a PI, being a professor, staying in academia statistically is actually the alternative career for people with your type of background and education. So um, I'm an editor. I have been an editor. I have worked as an editor in science publishing for the last 16 years, just over 16 years. I will tell you the jobs that I've had, how I got there, what these jobs are about, um, and just share with you sort of, you know, a couple of pieces of advice um, and then of course I will be available for questions. So I wanted to share this with you because it's something I found actually when preparing for another similar talk some time ago. These data are from the US. Uh, they are a couple of years old now, maybe more than some five years old or so. But they actually illustrate exactly the same point as you've all heard about and you're very um, familiar with. So basically what you see here is, oh, this is very straight angle. Um, what, what you see here is of course that when you have a PhD in biology, and I apologize to any of you in the room who are doing a PhD in another topic, but it almost certainly applies to you as well, you are most likely not to stay in academia, not to run a lab, and not to be a PI. So that's why I say you know, there's nothing actually that alternative about my career. And I won't go through all the numbers, you will have all the slides that say the data is slightly out of date. But I think somebody already said uh, here, I think the, the person who spoke just before coffee time, that it's actually 1% of uh, graduates who are likely to, to finish um, running a lab in an academic environment. We heard a lot about industry as well as, as academia, uh, a little bit of education now, so now we're moving into, into publishing. So why would you want to be an editor? And I'll tell you in a minute what exactly being an editor is, because I think um, the word itself, of course, has many different meanings. You can think of an editor as being, let's say, like an editor in a, in a newspaper, when you select the content from the, for your newspaper. That's actually probably quite a close approximation to the type of editor that I have been for most of my professional life. And of course, you can be a wordsmith, an editor who actually edits, massages other people's text. But then that is not something that I have done um, in my career. So everything I will be talking about today is about being an editor as in selecting scientific content for scientific publication. And I have been an editor of a few different flavors, and I'll explain this to you in a minute. So they say, why be an editor? Well, it's an opportunity to contribute to science by helping to disseminate it. So I have always felt in my 16 years since I left the lab, the bench, I have always felt that I have been a member of the scientific community. And this is not some delusion. I actually do actually feel this. I, I very much feel part of it. I'm invited to, to conferences, to be a mentor, a tutor, and so on and so on. And, and it, it really is a contribution that I make to science, which is in a different way from the way that you guys do by doing research. So as I say, I'm a part of the scientific community. You end up reading and hearing some of the most exciting research in, this, in the field that you are engaged in. And that's tremendously exciting. Um, you contribute to making science better as a process. Um, you have an opportunity to shape the future of, this, of science by selecting it and giving prominence to some aspects of science as they emerge. As you give them a platform, you help disseminate the information. Um, you get to travel a lot, so that's kind of fun for personal reasons, but that the travel to conferences and lab visits is actually an essential part of your growth as an editor and your ability to judge the science and contribute to the science um, as you work. 
you have opportunity to organize conferences. Again, that's an aspect of helping science grow and disseminate further um, information. There's some opportunity to write, but by and large, editors don't write very much. That's something that science writers and journalists do. Um, on the data side, increasingly, editors of scientific journals are more and more involved in helping scientists manage their data. Um, we actually help uh, implement and mandate open data policies, data sharing, etc., etc. so policies and standards. And similar, and through this and in other ways, there are also opportunities to help contribute to science robustness. So, my career path. So I started um, in science publishing as an associate editor on Nature Reviews Genetics. You'll hear the word genetics here a lot, I told you. Another genetics fan. Then I became uh, chief editor of the journal, um, and I did that for a number of years. Very briefly, I became associate publisher uh, within Nature Publishing Group. Um, I wanted to try the business side of the business, and very quickly, I actually decided that I didn't like it. That took me too far away from science, and I wasn't that interested in my company making more money. I was actually interested in helping people like you disseminate your research. Then I became senior editor for genetics and genomics at Nature, um, and after that, after about seven years of that, I became executive editor for uh, Nature Partner Journals, which is a group of academic journals, and by that I mean these, each of these journals has a group of academic editors, so in other words, working researchers, who are also editors for those journals, and I was an executive editor overseeing that group of journals. And then I took a year out of science publishing. I became um, director for science communications and uh, publishing, at Altius Institute in Seattle. Um, and then, literally, about three months ago, I came back to what is now called Springer Nature, this uh, uh, Nature Publishing Group before, um, to become Editor-in-Chief of Nature Communications. So I'm not going to talk about Nature Communications at all, apart from the fact that, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's an open access journal that um, is part of the Nature Research Group. Um, it publishes um, selective um, uh, papers across all disciplines of natural sciences, um, and it has been around for about seven years. And it publishes quite a lot of papers. We're talking about, the, you know, the, the, probably the most obvious equivalent that has existed for a long time is this of PNAS of, of, of this world. So how, I did, how did I get there? So I have a degree in genetics from University of Nottingham. Uh, and after that, I went to do a PhD in Cambridge in developmental genetics. And at the time, when I was doing my PhD, I was completely fixed on the fact that I was going to run a lab. It was a real dream. That's exactly what I wanted. And guess what? It was going to be in genetics, right? Because that, to me, was exactly the thing where bi all, every biologist should use the genetic approach to dissecting problems. This was the way to go. And I was going to, you know, revolutionize the world and God knows what. So I had a fantastic time. I really enjoyed both my degree and my PhD. And then I went to do a postdoc. Uh, at the time, it was called Imperial Cancer Research Fund, since then renamed as Cancer Research UK that was in London. And that, so my PhD was on C. elegans, and then my postdoc was what I now call on assorted vertebrates, right? So I used a bit of zebrafish, a bit of mouse, a bit of chick, but again, mainly genetic approaches because that was my way. So again, enjoyed that time very much. I actually recommend doing a postdoc to anyone who's interested in, in, in academic career. For me, that was a, a, a great, great time for, for all sorts of reasons. But as I was coming to the end of that postdoc, it suddenly dawned on me that while I was enjoying myself doing the research and thinking about uh, all the problems, actually I wasn't quite in a position to now begin to apply for my own, to set up my own lab. And so what do I do now? Do I do another postdoc? Uh, probably move somewhere completely different. I really enjoyed living in London. I sort of thought I was going to stay there. You know, I had lots of friends. And so I thought, actually, you know, so why is it that I'm not in a position to start my own lab after this postdoc? you know, postdocs in the UK are not as long as they're in the US, so maybe that's part of the reason. 
But the real truth was that while I was absolutely obsessed with the scientific method, and I, and I loved the, the, sort of the discovery process and the, the knowledge, the, 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 the increase of knowledge that I had, and, and you know, considering different problems that, that were arising, I was actually really, really bad with my hands in the lab. I wasn't a good experimentalist. And so, so I began to think, okay, so is there some other way in which I can contribute and also, in the meantime, you know, enjoy myself professionally, where I can stay within the scientific community and be part and parcel of that research and discovery without needing to do research myself. And so I began to think about various things, and, and to be honest with you, I actually fell into the career in editing. I, I was literally looking at the back of Nature magazine in the job section, and I saw the job advertised for associate editor, and I thought, well, I'll apply. And the, the job was in Nature Reviews Genetics, right? Genetics coming up again. So I applied for the job, and for that particular job, and I'll tell you in a minute what it entails, they actually send out tests to candidates to do at home. And the tests basically give you an exact, an exact idea of what kinds of things you will be doing while you're doing the job. So I had to write a short, like a research highlight, you know, choose a paper that I felt was important and write a little summary of it and say why it was particularly advanced, but you know, kind of publishable summary. Um, I had to um, come up with like a table of contents for a reviews journal, so in effect commission a number of reviews on topics, why I would commission them and who would write them. Um, and then they gave me a, a review and I had to sort of what, what's called developmentally edit, so suggest how that review could be made better, so how to tell a story better, what was missing and, and all this. So I had about uh, I don't know, two or three days to to do this in, and I absolutely loved it. And it was actually a complete surprise. I never thought about being a, an editor before. So I went to this interview, so I, I you know, s uh, submitted my, my um, uh, tests, super excited. I went to the interview, and I think I bullied them into giving me the job, because I was so excited about the prospect of getting this job. And I think some, there, were, there were a number of people talking about it this morning, how, you know, you, how do you convince those people that you are the right person for the job? And, and do you really want it, and how does that come across? I was telling someone uh, over lunch, I actually remember, I was sitting in the interview room, across the table from the people who were talking to me, and at some point, at the end of the interview, so they, so they said, okay, so why should we give you the job? And I actually got hold of the table, and I, you know, I leant forward, and I said, because I really want it, and I'm really enthusiastic about communicating science. And I know all about genetics, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I do remember that actually, that, that physical action of me leaning forward and being you know, really excited. Anyway, so I, guess what, I got the job. Um, so, um, so what are the kinds of, before I tell you exactly what, um, uh, what, what that particular job entailed, because I've had a couple of different editorial roles, and there are some important differences between them, and some of them suit some people better than others. But what are the kinds of qualities that we look for when we hire um, candidates for editorial jobs? So we certainly look for uh, broad scientific knowledge. Um, that's really important. You, you are a specialist in your field, but actually it's important that you have a good sense of what else is out there, um, of course within reason, and um, other areas may be adjacent to the area in which you studied. Um, what's really important is you have good judgment. Uh, also, that, that you reason well, you have good judgment, that you're decisive. Probably the most important quality of an editor is that you can make a decision and you can say why you've made that decision, so you can defend it, in other words. Um, it's really important that, of course, you're impartial, you have good in, interpersonal skills, you have excellent time management. And relevant to, what, to a number of discussions that were going on earlier today, um, PhD is an absolute requirement, and most of the time, uh, postdoc experience is preferred because that really feeds into that broad scientific knowledge. If you've done a PhD in a postdoc, you have a broader sense of what's going on uh, in your discipline. So the, the review editor responsibilities. So these are, these are editors who work on a uh, review journal. So this journal only publishes review material. These reviews are commissioned by the editors. Uh, the authors are helped by the editors uh, to develop a story, maybe illustrate them appropriately, 
although the actual artwork is done by an art editor, by somebody else. So you end up being involved directly, responsible for the content of the journal. You, you end up commissioning these reviews. So there's a, actually a very creative element to that role. Uh, of course, you correspond with authors a lot. You read papers. You travel to conferences. So, so this is where your ideas for commissioning of these reviews come from. And often, um, a review emerges as a result of a very active process between you as an editor and the authors um, of that review. You do some editing, actual text massage, as I called it before. Um, these, pe these reviews are peer-reviewed, so of course you manage peer review, you choose those reviewers and you manage their process. Um, and a number of, number of other things, like for example, working with an art editor on display items, working maybe with the web team, so you have um, if you have that creative streak in you, you are able to, um, to unleash that. Um, and, and of course, then work with many other, other different people, maybe on cross-journal projects in different topics that are um, adjacent to the ones that you specialize in. Now, a manuscript editor, that's what I did when I was an editor at Nature, does something slightly different. So here, of course, you don't commission reviews as such, but you're dealing with primary manuscripts. Many, most of them are submitted to you for your consideration, but many of those manuscripts you will go out as an editor to solicit. And you know, you may think that an editor of nature can just sit back and of course all the good work will come to them, but there's competition at every level. Of course, as when I was handling genetics and genomics at nature, there was a genetics and genomics editor at science. Cell was very interested in this topic and in some of the human, more medically applied areas, there are, of course, the clinical journals, like New England Journal of Medicine and, and the others. So it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very important active element uh, in that role as well. Of course, you read a lot, and very importantly, you evaluate submissions that come to the journal. 70% uh, of those papers are rejected by editors like I was without peer review. So there's a great responsibility, but it's a great opportunity to really develop your skills, your knowledge, your understanding of that particular field, which is also why it's so important that you're part of that scientific community. Um, again, of course, decision-making comes into it. Uh, there is some commissioning work, but uh, much less of it than in the previous role that I did and I described. Um, and more so in this case than in the previous case I described, you have the opportunity to be involved in editorial science uh, policy, uh, data policy, and, and um, increasingly um, helping um, make science more robust as a, as a process. So the next job I moved on to was the executive editor role, and that was really a, a much more mentorship-like role. So here I was working with um, established scientists, each of whom was in effect running their own journal, right, as, as chief editors of those journals. But often, most of the time, they needed my support in terms of policy, uh, direction where the journals could be taken, how the publisher that I worked for could support their efforts on their individual journals, um, and also you know, how the journals themselves, if they are being if they were new and they were just being launched, how, how they could be established, what, what were the best working editorial working practices. So very much a mentorship teaching role um, for those editors who previously had their own editorial experience, but of course only ever part-time because they're really full-time uh, working researchers. Um, in this type of role, there's much more emphasis on uh, collaborative working, um, there's some very interesting opportunity for, you know, uh, learning new skills in psychology and people management. When you manage people who you don't actually manage, that's a very interesting challenge. Um, a lot of problem solving comes into it. So it's really quite a varied um, and interesting uh, challenge. So my current role, um, uh, that of editor-in-chief on one journal, um, has elements actually of all the different roles that I described. So I, am, I have the final sole responsibility for the journal, although I don't actually handle any manuscripts anymore. Um, for me, an interesting challenge now, of course, is that I'm responsible for a journal which publishes right across all disciplines of science. I am no physicist. Um, I think it was only about two years ago that for the first time, 
I heard about spin trolley, for example, and I have entertained most of my friends over dinner um, about this for you know at least good, good, two, good two months. That, that sort of that was the the, the, the length of time it lasted. Um, but there's an opportunity to learn a lot, learn a lot from my colleagues, from scientists whom I go to visit. And of course, the type of conversation that I will have with a physicist is completely different from the type of conversation I will have with a biologist, but it's a tremendous opportunity for me. Um, it's an opportunity to um, bring lessons from one walk of science maybe to another, and as an editor, help some sciences and some disciplines move along in a way um, uh, learning and borrowing um, solutions and lessons from, from fields that already solved certain um, problems. For example, in, um, in terms of uh, data availability, data sharing, data deposition, and again, um, leading towards um, increasing science robustness. So it's quite a, quite a varied role. And of course, in my role right now, there is, of course, also um, direct management responsibility, um, which wasn't there in most of the other roles um, that I had before. So quite a, quite a variety of, of things here. So what about pros and cons of, of working as an editor of these different flavors? So in terms of, for me, the pluses really were, uh, or continue to be, um, that I have always felt that I was at the cusp of current research. So very exciting intellectually. Um, <coughs> Young is a relative term, I appreciate, but editorial teams tend to be, you know, at least young at heart and, and very dynamic and very informal. After all, all editors are former scientists, and, and that's really that, that knowledge and interest in science is what drives um, editors. Uh, when you work as an editor, you have a real sense of completion, right? Whether, whether you work for a, a journal that produces a monthly product, like for example I was when I worked on Nature Reviews Genetics, or whether, like now, so Nature Communications doesn't have issues, it has continuous publication, but every paper is a, is a specific product. Um, there are, uh, it's a very collaborative environment. Uh, there are uh, multiple travel opportunities, which I personally um, find very exciting, both personally but importantly professionally. Um, there are some very good career prospects. Um, and of course, there is job security. In terms of cons of working as an editor, the first thing on this list, I think, is the most important thing uh, that I always emphasize, and actually applies to most of the roles outside of actual research that, that were discussed today. When you become an editor, you have no role in discovery. So you take on a role in dissemination of science, but you no longer discover anything. And if you're the kind of person who gets out of bed in the morning because you want to see that new finding, that new gel, that new whatever it is that you work on, that really is what drives you, then very simply don't need research, right? No matter how bad it gets, but if that's what drives you, don't do it. For me, that wasn't an issue. I, for me, I, I was excited enough that somebody could tell me about a great story they just discovered, and I would help them tell the rest of the world about it. And I, you know, I, I felt very happy about it. Another downside is there are very tight and unpredictable deadlines. For you guys that, you know, at the moment, most of your um, uh, sort of examples like this come from grant applications. When you work in publishing, these deadlines come up all the time. It's definitely not a nine to five job, although this is not news to you. It is a demanding job. Occasionally you have to deal with angry authors, but let me tell you, it's extremely rare, actually. Um, Money is not a great driver to go into science publishing. It doesn't pay terribly well. Having said that, I've always lived in central London. I don't live in Chelsea, you know, the most expensive part of London, but I, I'm very happy. Um, and for me personally, um, one of the downsides was it's actually a very sessile job. So I do, you know, it's an office job. I sit in an office most of the time. Uh, when I was in the lab, I used to move around a lot. And when I first switched, to being an, ed an editor, I actually felt this was, this was something I, I, I found very hard to, uh, to deal with. So this is my uh, penultimate slide, really. I, I wanted to, th this is something I found a little while ago. Um, individual development plan. It's a, a thing you can find on, on the web, uh, prepared by uh, AAAS, so American 
Association for Advancement of Science, uh, who bring you Science Magazine. Um, it's actually, I think it's an excellent resource. It will take you through a number of questions, a number of options, um, which will help you find the things that you like and the things that you don't like, things that you want to do and things that you don't want to do. And then it will actually set up a set of goals, which you, if you choose to follow, um, it will prompt you with a certain periodicity whether you have fulfilled those goals or not. Have a go, see if you like it. Um, I, I actually did the test. Um, interestingly, the results of the test were fairly well matched with my career in publishing, so I thought that was quite interesting. Um, I didn't set myself any goals. I thought, you know, it's probably not, not a thing for me. But I, I recommend it, have a go. And so I will stop here. If you have any questions now or later, um, please ask me and you can get in touch with me by email or by Twitter. Thank you very much.